in the name of Jesus. You're welcome to Power for Leaving Service. Good evening, good evening. I hope you have had a wonderful day. Reach out to someone seated next to you and say to them, good evening, I hope you had a wonderful day. And to our online audience, good evening. We thank God for your lives. We thank God that you are connected with us this evening. We welcome you to the Power for Leaving Service today. And we trust that your lives will be better off for it in the name of Jesus. Even as you are seated here, even as you are connected, you will not remain the same way in the name of Jesus. You'll receive understanding like never before in the name of Jesus. I welcome you and I want to encourage you to share the link. Make sure someone is watching because of you. Make sure you share the link with somebody. Always, always share the link. That's, that's a gift that you can give to somebody. So please send the link and make sure someone's watching and also give the content a thumbs up so that it recommends it to other people hallelujah we were here this morning and then we're back here this evening god's grace is indeed sufficient for us his grace is sufficient for us and i'm going to be concluding my series today this is the conclusion of it like the final part of it i'm going to be concluding this evening the grace of god is sufficient for us I don't take for granted the opportunity and the privilege to be a part of this series. And I truly want to celebrate our parents and the Lord, our big mommy and big daddy. Please celebrate them. And wherever you are, put an emoji clapping for them. They're God's gifts and God's great gifts to us. We're so grateful for you, dad and mom. Thank you for your dedication, your tenacity. And it's our prayer that you will see the trem that you desire. The Lord will keep you alive and strong to see your heart desires concerning us and concerning the ministry in the name of Jesus. I celebrate all the pastors and all the leaders in the house and I trust that the Lord will speak to us expressly this evening. I was saying to myself, indeed, the path of the just is like a shining light and shines brighter and brighter. So this evening is going to be brighter and brighter in the name of Jesus. The Lord will crown up this message with his glory in the name of jesus let's pray father we thank you for today this is the day that you have made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it thank you father for seeing us throughout today oh god and thank you for the opportunity to be um, fellowshipping around your feet you said to martha one thing is needful and you have chosen Mary, sorry, you said to Mary, one thing is needful and you have chosen that good part. You were, you were talking to Martha about what Mary had done, about the decision she had made. You said to her, this is the needful thing. This is the one needful thing. And so we are not taking it for granted. We are sitting around your feet to learn your word tonight. And we ask, oh God, that you speak expressly through through me this morning through this through me this evening in the name of jesus thank you for a precision of expression in the name of jesus thank you for having your way holy spirit we give you perfect liberty have your way this evening let your word flow uninterrupted and unhindered in the name of jesus think through my Think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords. In the name of Jesus, let every hearer hear the word in their language and let their lives be eternally blessed by this word. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're going to start off real quick. The beginning chapter of this book, um, since Sunday we've been talking about the grace of God is sufficient. And it's just, you know, it's amazing. It's really, really you know, expository is mind opening. Your eyes are enlightened to know that his grace is completely sufficient for you. And this evening we'll be continuing that same vein, starting with look at Jesus. I'll be taking the last three chapters and I'm just going to run through. Look at Jesus, his grace is sufficient and accept your acceptance. We're going to be starting with look at Jesus. And I started off with a story when I was sharing earlier this morning and it's still very apt because while it was happening I had this service in my mind I said I said that I was faced with a situation where the power isn't you know the power isn't stable where we are and so it was so hot that day because there was no power there was no there was a complete power cut and it was extremely hot and I was preparing my notes and, pre, and studying for the service and preparing for today and over the weekend over Sunday as well I couldn't focus it because it was, it was really that hot. I just could not bring myself to focus. And, you know, I would try, I would go through bouts of maybe like five minutes of focus and then I would come back to the heat because it was just really prickly and it was very hot. And in that moment, I said, it was like an impression in my heart. 
if you can't focus on simple matters like this, when it comes to weightier matters, how are you going to focus? We're talking about looking at Jesus. And we know it sounds very sweet and very easy. But like we know, it's not always as easy when there is no money in your pocket. Will you be able to look at him? When there is no food on the table, when you haven't gotten that job yet, when you haven't had that child yet, would you still be able to fix your eyes completely on him? Would he be your focus? Would his sacrifice and all that he did for you be your focus? That's where the rubber meets the road, like our daddy would say. Would you still be able to look at him? Would you be able to look at him? In that moment, I I would have five minutes and then I'm just going back to, it's so hot. It's so hot. And I said, Uche, you have to, it starts with the little things. It's, it starts with the little things. It's not waiting for the big things to say, okay, when it becomes big, I will focus. I will learn the focus then. No, you practice with the little things. With the little things like what the Holy Spirit was teaching me through that past situation, you start to practice your focus. Because we must be able to look at Jesus and take our eyes off of what is not working. And take our, our eyes off of the situations that we're encountering and fix our eyes on him. Numbers 21, Numbers 21 from verse 4. Please give it to me, NLT. Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey. They were, I mean, they were impatient. It was too long. And they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out to Egypt to die here in the wilderness? They complain. There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. Can you imagine? Even the manna, they loathed it at some point. They were like, this is just horrible. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and they were beaten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away these snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. I'm sure that what they were expecting was like, Father, take in the name of Jesus, let the snakes be gone and the snakes will just disappear. I'm sure that was the expectation. But then look at what happened. Then the Lord told him, make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will leave if they simple, simply look at it. All who are bitten will leave if they simply look at it. All who are bitten. So it wasn't a case of snakes be gone. All who are beating will leave if they simply look at it. Verse 9. So Moses, Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was beaten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. If you will look at the cross and what Jesus has done for you, you will be healed. If you will focus on the finished work of Calvary, you will be healed because that was a type. We know that the Old Testament is New Testament concealed and the New Testament is Old Testament revealed. We understand that the Old Testament is types and shadows and so this was a type of Christ. Are you going to be able to focus on what he has done? If you will look in spite of your pain, in spite of what you don't have, in spite of your lack, in spite of everything that's going on, the prevalent circumstances, the scripture says, if you will look, then you will be healed. If you will look and see yourself in light of what the cross has done for you, in light of what Jesus, his sacrifice, his death, burial, resurrection has done for you, if you will look at it, all who are beaten will leave if they simply look at it. If you will look, then you will leave. On Sunday, we realized that we talked about the fact that people, the, Jesus had to be hung. He had to be hung so he could absorb the curse. That's what scripture says in Galatians 3. He had to be hung. And so we know certainly that this was a type. And it is emphasizing the fact that if you will look, it is our own responsibility to fix our eyes on him, to understand what the death, burial, and resurrection got for us. We must understand it. We must understand the implications of it, what it means, and we must know how to apply it to our lives. We must understand it. He, I mean, Jesus could, it could have been any other thing. It could have, I mean, he, could, he literally could have been stoned to death. It could have been any other thing, but he had to be hung on the cross. And the price was not easy. It was not an easy price to pay. We must understand this so that we can correctly appropriate it. I say this all the time and it bears repetition. Everything that we're trusting God for, money, house, husband, children, everything it is that we're trusting God, even raising the dead, happened before the cross. 
everything that we're trusting God for, everything that we pray for, everything that we intercede for happened before the cross. But salvation required him going to the cross. There was no two ways about it. He had to go to that cross. Salvation required that he would go to the cross and pay the ultimate price. And so of what use would it be if we don't sit down to learn what this, what this salvation means and how we can apply it in our lives? Of what use? The scripture makes it clear that it's by looking that we live. Luke twenty two forty one NLT. So we can see what, is, what, what, what really transpired. Luke twenty two forty one NLT, please. This is talking about Jesus. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. Verse 44. He prayed so fervently. He prayed so fervently and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. This is what salvation, the agony that he had to endure for our salvation. Even, be, even beyond everything else in terms of he still went to the cross. That was, all, I mean, a great sacrifice. Look at what happened, what preceded it. The agony, the agony of spirit. So how can we neglect so great a salvation? How can we just trivialize it? How can we say, oh, it doesn't matter. It's too elementary. Before it, he literally said, if there is any other way, everything else, if it's children, I can do that. Everything else can be done without me dying. But salvation, you must go to that cross. So it will be a great disservice, a great dishonor that he has paid this price. And then we don't understand what he means and we don't appropriate it in our lives. It will be a great dishonor. And I, I really pray that we don't dishonor that sacrifice in the name of Jesus. I pray that we live our lives from the standpoint of what Jesus has done from us, for us. From the victory on the cross, everything about our Christian faith, everything about Christianity stems from the cross. Every single thing stems from the cross. And that is why it's important, like Big Daddy, Big Daddy said in the book, to fellowship with his suffering. You have to fellowship with what he has done. You must sit down with what Jesus has done and fellowship around it. If you're going to be grounded, if you're going to be solid, if you're going to know what it is, if you're going to walk in your authority, you must fellowship with his suffering. You must know the price that was paid on your behalf and you must be able to apply that price that was paid on your behalf. You must stand brutally. These are the days to stand, stand brutally. I was saying to myself, the bite is a metaphor for a lot of things, a lot of things that we're experiencing. The bite can be no money in our pocket. The bite can be and pain in our body. It can mean a lot of things. The bite can also mean against this gospel because there is so much contention against this gospel. Uh -uh. Is it is only about the grace of God? Is it everything about the grace of God? There is so much contention and so that can be the bite. And then people are saying, eh, you, I mean, there, there, there are other things that you must do to, you must do. This is not enough. And I'm saying, what can you add to what Jesus has done? We must stand brutally and stubbornly in this sacrifice. We must fellowship fellowship with the sacrifice. This is the real gospel. What else are you going to do? What other work are you going to do? What other work? Because it's a case of, it's too easy. You're just telling people to just, you know, do whatever. And I keep asking, you cannot fellowship around the suffering. You cannot sit down, understand the sacrifice that was paid on your behalf and live anyhow. You can't. You cannot be fellowshipping in Isaiah 53. You can't sit down and be reading Isaiah 53. You can't read Luke 22, that scripture we just read that talked about the agony, what he had to endure prior to even going to the cross. It was already, I mean, it already weighed on his mind. I remember when I read that scripture one time I, I, and I sat down, I said, to, I, I literally started weeping. Because I said, every other thing that we cry and we're breaking our heads for and we're running after, could have been gotten, but you had to go to the cross. I sat, I literally started weeping. You cannot understand the immense price that was paid on your behalf and then say, oh, discard it. It doesn't, oh, it, it doesn't matter. You need to now do your own thing. What are you going to do? What else are you going to do? And this argument is so funny because I realized a lot of people want A for effort. They want Jesus to give them ah, Okay, you are doing well, you are trying. A for effort. There is no A for effort in Christianity. There is no 
literally, if you are not going to be founded upon what Jesus has done, upon his perfect sacrifice, unfortunately, that's not how it works. Please give me James 2.10, NLT, so that we can see this. For the person who keeps all the law, all of the laws, so you are keeping everything, all of the laws, except one, is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. A person who keeps all of the laws. Just, just it keeps on the scoring. I don't want you to depend on your effort. I paid the price. I went to the cross. I endured the agony. That's why I'm saying you cannot be fellowshipping around Isaiah 53 and live your life anyhow. You will live your life from that standpoint of victory. If it's in business, you will do business like Jesus is doing it. That's why Daddy keeps telling us we will be excellent because we understand the price that was paid on our behalf. We will give excellent service, excellent pro products, Whatever it, we are involved with, we will be excellent at it. You can't understand the price that was pay, paid on your behalf and just be anyhow. I said to myself, I can't be mediocre. The price on my head is too heavy. I can't afford mediocrity. It is too much. The sacrifice, not because I was worthy, not because I deserved it, not because I already chose him. He just chose to die on the cross of Calvary for me because he loves me. And then he says, come and enjoy. You can't understand that sacrifice. You can't be looking to that sacrifice and be anyhow. It would affect every area of your life. It would affect your business. It would affect your health. It would affect your spiritual. So beyond, the, not, not just uh, your spiritual life alone, your everyday life, when you meet people, when you understand the price that was paid, when you meet people, you extend grace. When you understand the price that was paid, when people do some things to you, you just, you just extend grace because you know what he did for you. You will forgive. In your marriage, you will forgive. You will say to yourself, ah, what is it that I can't forgive my spouse? Especially when the marriage is founded um, upon Christ. What is it that I can't forgive? You will forgive. You will walk in love. You will lead your life. Is it leadership? You will lead like Christ did, which is service. So you understand that leadership is not about title. It's about service. When you really, really fellowship with his suffering. I mean, I, I, I said to myself, there's nothing outside of this. There is nothing outside of this gospel. There is nothing else that we're teaching. When we fellowship around this gospel, when we truly understand the price that was paid, even sin, sin will be so disgusting to you because, like I said, I can't read Luke 22 and still want to, like, trivialize the sacrifice. I, I can't read to Luke 22. I can't read Isaiah 53 and want to dishonor the sacrifice. It, it doesn't work that way. You cannot want to dishonor the sacrifice. You can't be focusing on him. You can't be looking to him and dishonor the sacrifice. You can't. I gave an example of somebody on Sunday. I gave, an, I gave an example of somebody giving you a role because of somebody else. So somebody offers you a job, for instance, or an assignment or an appointment and says, I'm offering it to you because of John. Not necessarily because of you, not necessarily because you are qualified or anything. I'm just going to offer you this assignment because of John. How would you show appreciation for what has been given to you? Would you just take it anyhow? Would you be lackadaisical about it? If you are lackadaisical about it, that means you don't understand what was given to you in the first place. You don't honor the giver, neither do you honor the gift. You don't appreciate it. Because if you honor the giver and you honor the gift and you understand that, ah, it is because of John. Your actions will show it. You will literally, like, like Paul will say, I labored more than them all. You will labor more than them all. You will want to do everything to show the appreciation, the immense appreciation for the sacrifice. That's why that it keeps, keeps emphasizing. Grace is not a license to sin. When you understand the sacrifice, you, your own part to just be, how can I honor him? What can I possibly do? So when you're fasting, you're fasting from God. I just want to love you. I just want to know you. It's just because I want to take away all the distractions. It's not so much for you to do anything. I'm not forcing your hand. You have done it all. I just want to understand what it is that you have done for me. Your prayers becomes that the 
your prayers become thanksgiving and that your eyes may be enlightened for you to know you are praying from that standpoint of victory lord you have gotten this victory for me so you emphasize and insist on your victory everything that you do you are giving you are giving with honor you are giving with reverence because what can you possibly give what what is it what's money money you know money cannot buy life really money a lot of people have a lot of money and if they could buy life they would money cannot buy life but he gave his life for you so what money are you going to give you give him honor you give him reverence you give him with deep appreciation deep understanding of what he has done for you but then if we say no i want to do my own then you will live according to james 2 it is on his terms there will be the terms and conditions will apply and if you fail in one that's the that's the that's the danger people don't realize that oh i am doing well and i say how well is your well the scripture says it please put it in niv niv for whoever keeps the whole law i like how he says it and yet stumbles so you know jesus would always jesus should tell the pharisees if you're even thinking it you have never committed the act just mere thinking about it so that's what this scripture is saying and yet stumbles stumbles are just one point one you're not in this in this regard if you really think about it and juxtapose it with what jesus used to say he said you're just thinking about it you have not even committed the act and you have you are you have you're already messed up and you just stumble at one you are guilty of breaking all, all of it how can we live with such terms how if we had to earn this for ourselves we can't do it, it we can't do it we it's not possible we have to leverage on the sacrifice of Jesus. We have to understand what he, what he did for us. And grace is a teacher. By the time you start to fellowship around the sacrifice, he teaches you how to live. Nobody has to police you. He teaches you that, ah, at the office, I must give my best. He teaches you what to do. In this business, I must be excellent. He teaches you. He begins to teach you about excellent spirit. He teaches you. That's what Titus 2, 11 says, 11 to 12. Grace is a teacher. It teaches you how to deny ungodliness. For the grace of God... That has been revealed bringing salvation to all people verse 12 and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures we should live in this evil world with wisdom righteousness and devotion to god grace will teach you devotion to god grace will teach you ah, you won't want like I said, I have a greater appreciation for 1 Corinthians 15, 10. I labored more than them all. You, you, will be, you will do your best. You will go bananas for this God because you understand the sacrifice. It all stems from looking at what happened on the cross. Can I hear it louder? Can I hear an amen? When Jesus said it was finished, everything was finished. Everything was included in it. Finished means finished. Every, there's no area of life that Jesus did not think about on the cross. There was, there's no area of life that's not been included on the cross. There is no area that is left out. Finished is finished. It is, I mean, it's an absolute statement. It's not giving room for uncertainty or additions. It is finished. Complete. Perfectly perfect. Completely complete. Not, no area of life was left out. He thought about everything. And included it in this grace. Grace is a teacher. And so the greatest honor we can do, Isaiah 53, 10, NLT. But it was God's, the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that he is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many, for me, for you, to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. The greatest honor that you can give to God is to say thank you for this grace. Is to live your life in light of this grace is to appreciate this grace is to go bananas for him is to just let him know how much he means to you to appreciate the gift and the giver that just gave you this grace on the platter of gold that's the greatest honor that jesus look at your life and say it was worth it 
he would look at me and say it was worth it. It was, I paid the price. And these people are really living the life. They're li- really living out this grace-filled life. It is not a myth. It is not a fable. They're living the life. He will look at you. He will look at me and say the sacrifice was worth it. Amen? This was Paul's driving force. And so we fix our eyes on Jesus, all that he did, how he, how he, how he you know, went through everything that he went through for us. This is the way we overcome the storms of life. In this scripture, they were beating. They were going through so many pains, like we are going through. Even without you signing up for it, you are literally thrown into so many issues. Our world is filled with so many issues. No wonder Jesus said in Matthew 16, 33, that in this world, you will have trials and tribulations. It's not a game. You will have trial in this world. You will have trials and tribulations. But then he says be of good cheer why would he tell us to be of good cheer if he has not done everything why would he tell us to be excited why would he tell us to rejoice if he has not paid the price he says be of good cheer i have overcome the world the only way you can be of good cheer is when everything is done because he says we will have to, and we're seeing it we're seeing all manner of trials and tribulations every day you wake up you're not even able to keep up but he says be of good cheer because he knows what he did on the cross. He knows the price that he paid on our behalf. He says be of good cheer. I have gotten the victory for you. For, for you. I have obtained the victory for you. All I need you to do is stand in this victory that I have obtained on you. Fix your eyes in this victory that I have obtained on you. Stand in it. Stand brutally in this, in this victory. Stand brutally in this victory. Take your eyes off of what is not working. Take your eyes off of, of, of everything that's not happened yet and focus on what he has done. Big Daddy says in this book that as you focus on him and latch on to him in faith, you will become more like him. Looking to him is the key to transformation. If you want your life to be transformed, you're going to look to him. There is no other way to experience transformation. 2 Corinthians 3.18, NKJV. Second Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. As you keep beholding, he transforms you. I read the scripture again and I said to myself, so I'll be beholding Jesus and I'll be transformed into sin image. Let's think about it. I'll be beholding Jesus. I'll be focusing on Jesus. Beholding him. And I'll be transformed into sin. I'll be sinning more. It doesn't go. It, it literally is, I mean, it's that complete variant. Unless you are telling me that Jesus is full of sins. Because there is no way I can be beholding Jesus that I, and, and the Holy Spirit to be working in me. Because it says the Holy Spirit that does the transformation. As I, my own part is to behold, to say, yes, Lord, I believe your word. I believe your word says this is who I am. I am who your word says I am. I am beholding and I'm be transformed into an image that complete variance to who he is. It's not possible. It's not possible. As you behold him, you become more like him. That's why our part, you, the truth of the matter is that people that are focused on that are beholding other things. They're not focused on him. You are beholding other things. If you behold him, you will be transformed. The word cannot be broken. The word is, is true. It's true for all seasons. As you behold him, you will be transformed into his image. Big Daddy says, stop looking at yourself. Stop looking at your inadequacies. That was a word for me because I have a penchant of looking at myself and saying, ah, you know, yes, it's good to assess. Yes, it's good to review. Yes, it's good, good to say, oh, I probably could have done this better. But stop looking at yourself. Look at him. After you have done the review, put your eyes back on him. He's your image. He's your reality. Daddy always says it. The word of God is our reality. That is our true image. Put your eyes there and say, this is who I am. Keep speaking it. Keep declaring it. Even when it doesn't look like it, you keep declaring, this is who I am. This is who the word of God says I am. The word of God is not a lie. This is my reality. You keep speaking it because change happens as you behold what you desire to become. You become what you behold. And so beholding errors, shortcomings, it's not going to do much for you. Genesis 30, from verse 37. Please give it to me in TPT. Jacob, however, cut green green branches of poplar, almond, and plane trees and peeled back part of their back to expose the white inner wood of the branches. 
Then he set the partially peeled branches inside the water troughs where the goats would see them. They would behold them when they come to drink. For they mated when they came to the water troughs, and as they lowered their heads to drink, they saw the stripped branches in front of their eyes. What are you keeping in front of your eyes? They saw the stripped branches in front of your eyes. What are you beholding? What are you focusing on? What you focus on is what you become. And miraculously, because it's the work of the Holy Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit that does the transformation. Miraculously, they gave birth to strict, speckled, and spotted young. These were goats that were one color. But as they, as they looked to what the bark that Jacob put in the water, the peeled bark to it that he put in the water, as they looked, as they focused, they became streaked, speckled, and spotted young miraculously. As you look to him, the Holy Spirit became begins to do a miraculous transformation your part is to keep looking as you look to him he begins to change you from the inside out he begins to change your desires he begins to change your want tos the things that you want to do he changes your desires and he not only changes your desires he gives you the power to actually follow through with that desire that he is giving to you he changes your desires that's why the scripture says it is him that walketh in me both to will and to do he gives you the desire and he empowers you to actually do. He gives you the desire. He empowers you. Paul is a great example of this. He gave Paul the desire and he empowered him to do. He gives you the desire and he empowers you to do. So that thing you have been struggling with that you have not been able to stop, you focus on him and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He begins to change your desires as you own and take ownership of who he has called you. As you, ownership, as you take ownership of the eternal life that you have in him, he begins to change your desires. As you own the scriptures, you go into the scriptures and say, this is who I am. This is my reality. You make the scriptures your own. Philippians 3.12 in AM Amplified Classic states that very clearly. You take the scriptures and make it your own. This is who I am. He begins to transform you. He begins to transform you. Not that I've already attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of, grasp, and make my own that for which Christ Jesus the Messiah has laid hold of me and made me his own. He made you his own. He paid the price for you. And so it is your own responsibility to lay hold of it, to grasp it, make it your own, make the sacrifice of Jesus your own, knowing that he paid the full price. A man of God calls it effortless change. Effortless change. And I gave this example, but I, I, it's important that I repeat it. A young person whose mother was trying to get him to change. She didn't like his neighborhood. She didn't like his friends. And so she said to him, come with me. I want to, you know, I want you to go to Bible college for six months. And if you go, to, if you agree, I'm going to give you a car. I'm going to give you housing. I'm going to pay your bills. I'm going to do everything that you want. All because she was trying to get him out of a particular environment. And so she bribed him and the bribe worked. That, that, that's wisdom on display because it was Bible college and she knew that it would be good for her son. So her son made it a point of duty to announce to everybody, oh, I'm going for six months and I'm coming back. I only agreed because mom is giving me A, B, C, D, E, F, G. All of the benefits I'm getting is the only reason. And even while in Bible college, he announced to everybody, in six months, I'm out of here. And the time drew closer. He kept announcing, ah, I'm out of here. I'm done. I'm on my way out, you know. He literally was very braggadocious about this because he felt, ah, I'm done with this deal. But then he goes home. He goes home after sitting under the word for six months and realizes he can't fit in. He can't fit in with the same crowd. He can't fit in with the same people. There be something significantly different about him. He cannot fit in with the usual things, with the things that everyone was doing. Big Daddy will always say, don't underestimate a man that is sitting under the word. You cannot be sitting under the word and not experience transformation. And then how much more when you are focused on the word, when you are deliberately taking in the word, when you are beholding him and the sacrifice that he made on your behalf, how much more will this transformation occur in your life? Our part is to look and live. He's our reality. If such a young man could be transformed without even trying, he didn't want it. He did not want it, but there was, there's, there's no stopping the word. 
He didn't want to be transformed, but you can't stop the word. Once that word enters, you must bear fruit. And you sit down under the word. You cannot stop the transformation. That is the key to our transformation. We must fix our eyes on him. Especially today. Life is not taking permission from us to be thrown into deep waters. We are thrown into deep waters whether we like it or not. How can we walk on water if we do not see, fix our eyes on him? The wind is boisterous everywhere that you look. It doesn't matter. From Nigeria to Canada to the United States, I, I, I came across a post of a young lady who lives in the UK and she was advising people that, ah, I'm not sure I want to raise a family here. She has a family now and she's saying, I'm looking for where to go in the next few years because I, I don't really want my kids to grow up in this environment and she was telling people to look outside look elsewhere and i smiled and i said wow the uk where everyone is like literally there is no hope anywhere the hope is in the word there is no location that has the answer that's exactly what i just read that i said no everywhere that you look there is one problem or another is it in the us i was watching a video about how children go to the hospital and um, you know children teenagers go through a lot of things and once they go to the hospital to say you know i'm not their emotions are all over the place as a teenager everything is happening at once and they just you know tell them oh you know we can do a sex change from like a 30 minute meeting the lady works in the hospital and came out on tv and was complaining she had to resign she's like this is insane you're talking to a child for 30 40 minutes and you have already concluded that the child needs to change their sex so you start to give the child drugs a lady you say ah you know maybe you're not happy being a lady you'll be happy as a guy and then they begin to pump you immediately as you are leaving the hospital they begin to make recommendations write to your therapist and say oh make recommendations for her to start hormone blockers that's the world we're living no place has the answer the answer is in the word of god what are you going to do where are you going to run you must be solidly anchored in the word today there is no two ways about it you must be solidly anchored in the word and being anchored in the word is being anchored in his death burial and resurrection because everything about life stems from his death burial and resurrection every single thing every single thing stems from it and for the believer, victory is already assured. First John 5, 4, NLT. For every child of God, for every, I love this, I love this translation. I love it so much. I love First John 5. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a word head. I love the Bible so much. For every child of God defeats this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. Every child of God, no exception. Only people who choose to make themselves exceptions are the exceptions. Every child of God. If you are, if you are I mean, every is every. Everything is contained in everything. Every is every. Every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. Verse 5. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Only those believing, I, I sang a song, Jesus the Son of God, I believe in you. I believe in your sacrifice. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came to this world. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again for my justification. I believe in what you did. When you believe in what he has done, that is where the victory is. You are a world overcomer, like our daddy would say. No matter the situation, no matter the circumstances, delete your names from the victims list. You are not a victim. You are a victor. You are more than conquerors. You have the victory. You are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. You are in that situation. I don't know what it is. You are an overcomer. Decree and declare it on a date in the face of it. You are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. We can't, this is why we must not toy with our Christianity. These are not the days to be naive. These are not the days to be ignorant. You must know. You must know. The demands that are being placed on us are a demand. Do you know? What do you know? Those are the demands. We must answer the question. What do you know? That is what life is throwing us, throwing us with now. What do you know? You must know that you know. You must know it in your Noah, like our daddy would say, deep down inside of you what Christ has done. You must know the authority that you wield in Christ Jesus. You must know that the promises are yours, that in him all the promises are yea and amen. Please give me 2 Corinthians 1.20, Amplified. 
2 Corinthians 1.20. For as many as the promises of God in Christ, in Christ they are all answered. In Christ all the promises are all answered. Yes. So through him we say our amen to the glory of God. Big Daddy was speaking a couple of Sundays ago and he was talking to us about the power of prayer. And how prayer is taking delivery of that which God has perfected. The promises are what God has perfected concerning the matter. So are you sick? He has said you are healed. Are you, are you, is, there, is there lack in any area of your, of your life? He says he will supply all your needs according, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Is he a school fees matter? It's already provided. It's already provided through prayer. You know what the word of God says. You know his promises and you take delivery of it. You insist on the word. You insist that I am healed. The songwriter says, uh, and now let the rich say, let the poor say, I am rich. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Let the, let the sick say, I am healed because of what Jesus has done. You know what Jesus has done. And you stand brutally in that truth. You take that which belongs to you. You insist on your right. You insist on what belongs to you. You enforce it. You enforce it. You superimpose that word over the situation and over the challenges that you are faced with. You stay there. No shifting ground because that is how we win. Hallelujah. Psalm 34 verse, nine, verse 5 makes it clear that we will look to him and our faces will be enlightened and we will not see shame. There is no shame for us as we keep our eyes on him. There is no shame for us. And so when, when all of this, that, when all, with everything that Jesus has done for us, Christianity will not be a struggle. We will just rest in him. We will live our lives from the point of the sacrifice. This is why it's so vitally important. And I'm not saying, I'm not preaching at you because this is something that has, that's a necessity. I cannot thank God enough that I am on this teaching series. I cannot because every time I'm on, I'm privileged to teach or preach or even speak, whatever it is, I'm always the first beneficiary. And I'm so grateful to God for that. I'm like, God, you know your child. Um, it must bless me first. It must transform my life. And so I'm saying to myself, Uche, you will fellowship with what he has done. You must know. You must know. And so that you can be able to exercise your authority and dominion. If you don't know, you can't exercise authority and dominion. You cannot. And the devil will pluck out your eyes. He's really, really waiting. You know, if any chance that you give to him, I was saying on Sunday that Eve was naive. Even, your, even naivety is not an excuse. He's not going to feel sorry for you or that, ah, I really feel sorry or she's a bit naive. He's not going to feel sorry for you. His time is short. He's shooting at random. We cannot afford to be victims of what he's doing. We must know. We must fellowship around what, has, what he has already done. We must stay connected to him. We must stay connected to him. And so as believers, we live our lives from what he has already done. This is why Jeremiah 29, 11 message says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all figured out. So when a challenge comes, you're not running around, ha, what am I going to do today? You are saying, what has he already done concerning this? You are living your life from what has been done. You're going into the words, you're going into the scriptures to find out what has he already done concerning this. It is his responsibility to do the heavy lifting. My own is just to rest in what he has done and enforce my victory. And enforce my victory. He has already worked it out. He has already worked it out. I rested him. I rested him. Without a doubt, God's grace is sufficient for us. Without a doubt, his grace is sufficient for us. I mean, just understanding this message, you're saying to yourself, this grace is enough. Everything I need is embedded in this grace. 2 Corinthians 3.5. NKJV. NKJV. Not that we are sufficient to think of ourselves. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being of ourselves. But our sufficiency is from God. Our sufficiency is from God. 2 Corinthians 12 9. NKJV as well. And he said to me, Your, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient. His gra God will not say his grace is not sufficient if it's not sufficient. If he thinks you need grace plus, plus, plus. The Bible is very clear. That's one thing I love about the scriptures. There is no ambiguity. If God thinks you need grace plus another thing, something added, he will put it there. My grace is sufficient, but... But he says it clearly. My grace is sufficient for you. It's a complete statement. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. 
God's strength is made perfect in our weak. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Grace is not for the strong, our daddy says. It's not for the strong. It's about his strength. It's about his ability. So are you feeling weak in any particular area? Are you feeling, you know, um, not empowered in a particular area? His grace is sufficient for you. That's why Paul would celebrate his weakness. Because he knew that, ah, this weakness that I have is making me a candidate, has made me a candidate for his grace. I used to think that you had to be perfect. You had to be the best. You had to be strong for God to use you. And then the scripture comes along. And now I'm saying, ah, his grace is perfected in my weakness. His grace is perfected. At, am I weak in any area? I, I feel like in this area, I don't measure up. I don't focus on that thing that I'm not measuring up in. I focus on what he has said. His grace is made perfect in that area that I feel like I don't measure up. I keep focusing on, it, on his word. I keep declaring, your grace is sufficient for me. Your power is made a perfect in my weakness. First, Second Corinthians twelve nine NLT says it very perfect. Second Corinthians twelve nine. Each time he said, "My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness." So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ, it's the power of Christ, it's the power of Christ can work through me. And so if I'm deficient in any area, I'm saying, Father, I thank you because your power works in this area. I'm seeing your power on display. I keep declaring it. I'm seeing your power on display in this area. In this area of weakness, I'm seeing your power on display. Maybe I'm not getting it quite right yet. Maybe I'm still falling down. But I wake up in the morning and decree and declare what he has said concerning me. Your power is made perfect in this weakness. That is how to live our lives on a daily basis. We must live from the standpoint of victory. What has he done? What has he done? It is the scriptures. That's big that we always say, put up the scriptures so we can see. We're not making up words. The Bible makes it very clear. Yo, his power works best in weakness. So I own that scripture. I make it my own. I decree and declare to myself, his power works best in weakness. In weakness. Even your imperfections, his power is at work. His power is at work. Don't, you, don't believe me, ask Gideon. Gideon. Gideon was, I mean, weak. Weak. And then God looks at him and says, you're a mighty man of valor. Someone that was hiding to... Um, um, to, to um, refined wit in the wine press. He looks at him and says, you're a mighty... That's not a picture of a mighty man of valor. That's not a picture of a mighty man of valor because God... One thing I found out about God, he will never speak to you about your... what you're experiencing. What he, when, he, when he says something to you, he's not going to match reality. It's going to be so far... You're going to be saying me. When he said to Abraham, you're a father of many nations and changed, their, changed his name from Abraham to Abraham, he did not look like it. You're going to be looking at yourself and saying me. And that's why you, that big daddy says you must take your eyes off of yourself and focus on who he has called you. You must focus on who he says that you are. You must own it. You must, dec- you must know it's more than you know your name. Like more than like you, at the same level to which you know your name or even better than you know your name. This is who I am. It doesn't matter what it looks like now. This is who God says that you are. It did not look like it. He would, God would, Honestly, he will never speak to us based on our present reality. He's not going to look at, you know, a woman who hasn't had children and say, oh, she's barren. Or a woman who hasn't had a husband. He's going to keep speaking to what he says. He's going to call you a fruitful vine. He's going to call you, like, delightsome land, married. He's going to call you the desire of, 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 of who it is that he has ordained for you. That's what he's going to call you. He's not going to call you, oh, ah, depraved, lack. He's not going to be calling you that. That's not how he sees you. He sees who he has made you to be. And so it is our responsibility to walk in light of who he has made us to be. To say, this is who I am. Shut your eyes to what is not working. Fix your eyes on him. I love that when daddy said that. Daddy said, sometimes you must close your eyes because what you are seeing is intimidating you and saying, no, it can't happen. That can be who God is saying you are. Shut your eyes and say, this is who I am. I insist on the word of God because the word of God can never fail can I hear a loud amen? amen the disciples in Mark 16 had been with Jesus this whole time and you will think these disciples will be strong 
will be solid, will be established. I mean, that if they say, they, they didn't even need to wait for Jesus to resurrect. They would have been that solid that they would have started, they would have started the celebration from Friday because they know that resurrection is coming. They would have been crying. After spending that much time with Jesus, you would think they would be solid. Because when you have an understanding that this is not the end, that resurrection is coming on Sunday, you will start rejoicing because you know that whatever the devil is doing, he's just messing around. He's just reacting. It's, it's, I mean, it's already done. But that was not the case. They didn't even believe. Even after Sunday, they did not believe. And these are the same people that God decided to bestow his power into. Because Jesus is saying, if you read that in Mark 16 from verse 15 to 17, you will see that he still put his power, he still sent them. In their weaknesses, in their frailties, he still sent them, going to all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing people in my name, and you will cast out demons. These same people that didn't believe you, he still sent them out. Because Jesus is basically saying, your weakness cannot hinder my strength. Your weakness cannot hinder my strength. I will be glorified in your life. I don't know what you think your weakness is. I don't know what... You need to take your eyes off that weakness. You need to take your eyes off that weakness. And I'm speaking from a point of knowing. Because I remember when I used to be like, ah, can I really, can I ever... I had to shift my focus. It's not about me. It's about him. It's about his power being displayed through my life. You need to take your eyes off of that weakness. Stop looking at yourself. Can I, can I look to him and what he has done? Take your eyes off of the weakness because his grace is greater. His grace is greater than anything the enemy could ever bring against you. The enemy think, oh, thinks I've gotten him. I've gotten her and her weakness. Grace is greater than the weakness. Grace is greater than the weakness. Big Daddy will always say, what God is doing in you and what he's doing for you is greater than anything the enemy can ever do against you. Hallelujah. And as you focus on his, on his grace, he gives you even more grace. James 4, 6. He gives more grace. He gives more grace. As you begin to experience one level of grace, it's another level of grace. The grace keeps on unfolding. There is no expiration on the grace. There is no end to this grace. It keeps unfolding. One level of grace to another. He keeps unfolding his grace. Ah, can I really do this? Yeah, and you step out. His grace keeps unfolding. One level of glory to another another do not refuse him who has spoken out of heaven i love the scripture so much hebrews 12 25 nlt hebrews 12 25 be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking for if the people of israel did not escape when they refused to listen to moses the earthly messenger moses was an earthly messenger and they didn't escape we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven he can't be saying that this is who you are you are saying no the book the book said something there was just a phrase that just you know made me so excited do you know more than god he's saying this is who you are you're saying no he can't be me he's saying this is who you are. I said, Gideon said, me? Do you know who you are talking to? In my household, in my, in my village, in my, in my community, they see our clan as the weakest. And then within my own family, they see me as the wicked. And you are calling me a mighty man of valor. How? Me. It couldn't even relate. But, Jesus, but God said, the angel said to him, that is who you are. You are a mighty man of valor. He kept talking, talking. He said, go in this trend. And then Gideon just started to say, ah. It, it, thing, it started to infuse him with supernatural strength. He was like, hmm. And he's like, okay, how would this happen? What will happen? He says, I will be with you. Because it's about him. I will be with you through that. And Gideon now says, okay, okay, okay. Uh, if you say this thing is real, I'm going to go and bring a sacrifice. He started to see himself in light of who God said he was. And that's why the book says, and our devotional for today, accept your acceptance accept your acceptance accept who he calls you that that scripture we read in james 4 the b part of it talks about humbling yourself humbling yourself there says that i am who god says that i am even when i don't see it he gives grace to the humble humble yourself therefore that he may exalt you because he gives grace to the humble as you humble yourself to say this is who i am this is who irrespective of how i feel or i don't feel i believe that this is who i am i believe that i am the righteousness of god in christ even when i mess up that is the more reason i need to believe that i am the righteousness of god in christ even when i don't measure 
stir up. That is the more reason that I must hold on vehemently to the truth of the word of God and say, this is who I am and keep my eyes on the cross because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, this is who I am. This is my reality. I keep my eyes on the cross, decreeing and declaring who he made me. Not how I feel about it. Not what I think. Not what I think. First John 3.20 NLT. For us feelers, for if we feel, even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings. He knows everything. God is greater than our feelings. He knows everything. He knows who he has made you. He knows who he has wired you to be. He knows everything. He's greater than your feelings. So it is in your best, it's in your best interest to say, I am who he has made me, irrespective of what you are, what you are facing. Big Daddy will say, as you, as you see it, you become it. it is, we don't, we, we, as, as, you, as you decree and declare it, then you become it. In, the, in, the, in, in, in our own kingdom, we don't see. We don't say seeing is believing. We believe to become. As you begin to decree and declare, this is who I am. That is how you become it. And we've seen that in 2 um, Corinthians 3.18 very clearly. That you behold and then you become. As you say, this is who I am. I believe your word concerning me. Then you become it. Then the Holy Spirit goes into oppression to make that which you become a reality. We don't live by how we feel. We don't go by what we think. We don't live by, oh, you know, I just feel like that. No, we go by what he has called us. And God really believes in what he puts in us. He believes, he wouldn't have given us the Holy Spirit if he didn't believe what he has put on the inside of us. He gave us the Holy Spirit. I was listening to that. I was, I was praying this morning. And the song came up in my mind, the Zoe song. And that line that says, I'm the image of the loving God. He gave me the priceless gift. He gave me the priceless gift of the Holy Ghost. And through me, God is revealed. It just really, really hits me. Because I said, with all these works that people are saying, thank God God is no man who... Because man would have said five step, ten steps to receiving the Holy Spirit. You have received Jesus. So the way we, we interpret things is, ah, Jesus is the base. Jesus is loving. Jesus is kind. Everybody loves Jesus. Jesus loves everybody. He's the base. But you see that Holy Spirit, you have to, you have to do something. You have to show your workings. You have to put effort to receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the, ah, I understand that Jesus is giving. But your Holy Spirit, level ten. And then we start to climb. But at salvation, he gave us the Holy Spirit to help us to become who he has made us. He, and he trusts what he puts on the inside of you. He trusts the work. Calvary, we need to understand what took place at salvation. We need to stop trivializing it. Salvation is so rich. It's everything. It's the foundation for our Christianity. There is nothing else. It is too rich. When we understand the transforming power of salvation, all these other things that we keep talking about, it will literally, I mean, everything will just be built. It's the foundation is the, salvation is the base. Everything is a building on top of salvation. He trusts, he trusts the work of salvation so much, he entrusted us with his spirit. He entrusted us with his spirit to help us work it out. To say, I know you need help, don't worry. I'm here every step of the way. God is, God is awesome. When you sit down and fellowship with this, you're just in awe of this God. As you keep your mind stayed on the word, as you accept what he has said concerning you and you walk in it, therein lies our victory. Let's just stand up and give God praise wherever you are. Thank him for this awesome, awesome gift. Thank him for this everything that we're Everything we're, we're talking about is because of Jesus. Because of one man. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Because of one man that laid his life on the cross of Calvary. That's why we can even come to the throne of grace and obtain, and obtain, and obtain a mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That is why your offering will be acceptable because of Jesus. 
Father, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We cannot thank you enough. Thank you for your perfect work. We can't add to it. He's perfectly perfect, completely complete. We will not add to it. It is arrogance to think that we can add. We can't add anything to it. So we just say thank you. We love you, Lord. We appreciate you. We exalt you, Lord. Thank you for counting us worthy. Thank you for counting us worthy. Like our father will say, I know me. I know my inadequacies. I know my shortcomings. I know the things that I'm not doing well, but he still counts me worthy. He still reckons with me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary that makes me worthy. I give you the praise, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have given thanks. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you appreciate this, God, you will bring out a worthy offering. Like I said, it changes, it changes how you give. You're not giving from, oh, ah, okay, transactional. We're past the stage of transactional. It's not transactional. We're just in awe of this God who has given us so much. And we don't tip him because we know that we understand the, the gift. We understand the giver. We don't tip him. We appreciate him. We're saying, thank you, Jesus that we, we, we can give to you, that you will take from us, that you will even take from us. He doesn't need anything. We just give him to just worship him and let him know that we love him. You know, when you read the scriptures and you will say that the people were just bringing and bringing and bringing and because they were just like, what can we possibly give? In Acts, they were bringing, they just kept bringing because what can we, every time they would hear the gospel, they kept telling Paul, tell us again and again. They didn't want any other message. They just wanted the gospel because the gospel is the message. Just to say thank you. The, the details are on the screen for transfer. You can transfer and if you have cash, just lift it up on high. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness, your loving kindness and tender mercies. We're so grateful to you. What can we possibly give you to say thank you? Thank you that you would even accept gifts from mere mortals as us, oh God. We're so grateful. Thank you for all that you did for us to enjoy our Christianity, to enjoy our walk with you and to give the devil a black eye. We give you the praise, the glory, the honor, the adoration. We thank you, Father. We ask that you accept our gifts this evening and accept us, oh God. Let it come as a sweet-smelling savor to you, oh God. In the name of Jesus. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can give your offerings. You can give your offerings even as I give the announcement. You can give your offerings. So we'll have prayers on Friday. Prayers on Friday, 3 to 6. I don't think anybody needs to tell anybody to pray today. Uh, no, but, uh, honestly, it, it, it's prayers 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock on Friday. You can either connect or come here physically to pray with us. But it will be an um, awesome time of prayer. And of course, Saturday is our marathon. Marathon prayers from 9 to 6. You need to make sure that you're in the auditorium. Make sure that you are here. Make sure that you are ready to pray. Make sure you don't miss it. Nine to six Saturday. It's going to be amazing. You don't want to. I mean, I look forward to these meetings. And I also implore you to prayerfully prepare yourself. This is our year of great and mighty things. There is nothing the devil can do about it. Everything that he's doing is just, he's just playing games. The world already went ahead of all, everything else. The world went ahead of every other situation. And so we will enforce great and mighty things and we will see the manifestation of great and mighty things on Saturday in the name of Jesus. And next week is IWPC, International Women's Prayer Conference. Make it a date. The theme is you have authority. You have authority. You, are, you have authority. We're going to be exercising our authority on that day. Please make it a date. Make sure you invite people next week, Thursday, 9 a.m. is the time. You have authority. All right. And Sunday service, make sure you are there to celebrate Jesus. Let's just appreciate Jesus for all that we have received. Thank him for all that he did for you. Thank him because he will look at your life and he will be satisfied. He will see that the sacrifice was indeed worth it. You will walk in the reality of this truth. 
in the name of Jesus. You will walk in the reality of this truth. You will fellowship with his suffering and appropriate it into your life. That's the greatest honor that we can give to him. We will not despise the sacrifice. We give you the praise, Lord. We thank you, Father, because as we go home, your presence goes with us. Thank you, Jesus, because you will continue to stir this word in our hearts. You will continue to stir it into our hearts. It will take roots downwards and bear fruits upwards. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's share the grace. Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in God's presence forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful night's rest. God bless you real good.